I love to mix stuff up. Sometimes I like to go into the kitchen, grab some ingredients, and put them together just to see what happens. And it's kind of like we're making magic potions. When you mix stuff together, sometimes you'll notice that interesting things start to happen. For example, sometimes one of the ingredients might seem to disappear. And at other times, the ingredients just kind of hang out together and don't really mix up. So when we mix things together, we can pretend we're making potions, but what we're really doing is better than magic. It's science. Let's try to make a few pretend potions and see what we can learn about them. For our first mixture, all you'll need is a clear container, a spoon, some water, and some play sand. Fill the container with water. Water is a great start to any potion. Now, put a big spoonful of sand into the container and mix it around. What do you see? What's happening? When you mix the sand and the water really fast, the sand spreads out in the glass pretty evenly. You can see the sand floating around in the water. But once you stop stirring and you wait just a few seconds, what happens? The sand settles to the bottom of the container. The sand and the water separate. So what kind of potion did we make? We made something called a suspension. In a suspension, the ingredients that you mix together can be separated from each other once they've been mixed. Often, when you let your mixture sit, the heavier ingredients will fall to the bottom of the container like our sand did. And if you poured your mixture through a filter like a paper towel or a coffee filter, you could separate the sand from the water. Let's try it. You can see that the water falls into the glass while the sand stays on the filter. You've unmixed your potion. Now, let's try a different kind of a potion. We can use water again, but this time, instead of adding sand, let's add a few spoonfuls of sugar. Mix the sugar around with a spoon like you did with the sand. Hmm. What's going on? The sugar is small and grainy like the sand, and at first it might seem like we're making another suspension, but keep stirring. What's happening now? Whoa, it looks like the sugar is totally disappearing into the water. But it didn't actually disappear. You can see for yourself if you take a sip of our potion, It tastes sweet. The sugar is still in there, but you can't see it anymore. That's because in the water, the sugar dissolves or breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces until it gets mixed into the water evenly. This kind of a potion is called a solution. Solutions are mixed together totally evenly and they can't be unmixed. Even if you let the glass of water stand still for a long time, the sugar won't settle to the bottom. And if you wanted to try to filter the sugar out like the sand, all of it would just pour right through. Now, let's make another couple of potions. And based on what we've learned, let's see if we can figure out if it's a suspension or a solution. This time, instead of using an open container, we'll put a lid on so we can mix things up really well. Pour some water into the jar until it's about halfway full. Then add a few drops of food coloring, any color that you'd like. Now cover up your jar and shake it up. What happened to the food coloring? The coloring is mixed up evenly, and if you let the jar sit, the coloring doesn't settle to the bottom. Since the ingredients don't separate, it must be a solution. Next, we'll add a totally new ingredient, oil. You can use vegetable oil or olive oil. Put some into the jar, and then put the lid on. And now, shake. Shake your jar all over the place. Try and mix the water and the oil together. When we set the jar down, what happens? Look, the oil forms big globs in the water. And after you let it sit, the oil and water totally separate. What kind of potion do you think this is? If you said suspension, you're right. So now you know two kinds of mixtures that you can make. Suspensions, where the ingredients combine together but can separate again. And solutions, where one ingredient dissolves or breaks up into teeny tiny pieces into the other. And solutions can't be separated. Keep mixing stuff together Together and let us know what kinds of cool potions you make.
weeks, how about we have a little snack? I have something in mind that I think you'll really like. This snack comes from a cow, but it's not milk. So it's actually something that's made from milk. That's true, we've made butter from milk before, but it's not that either. Yep, it's cheese. This is Swiss cheese. It's called that because it was originally made in Switzerland, which is a country in Europe. But now Swiss cheese is made all over the world, including here in the United States. You might notice something about this cheese that you don't normally see in other foods. It has all these holes. Most other types of cheese don't have holes in them, so Swiss cheese is pretty special. Cheese experts actually call these holes eyes, which is kind of funny because they're totally different from our eyes. So why does Swiss cheese have eyes? Is it because Squeaks has been nibbling on it? I'm just kidding, Squeaks. The holes in Swiss cheese aren't made by animals. Let's get to the whole story. Get it, Squeaks? Hole. The really cool thing about cheese is that it's actually made with germs. Yeah, that's right, germs. Another word that scientists use to talk about these germs is bacteria. And there are some kinds of bacteria that can make us sick, but the bacteria in cheese is safe. Cheese makers add different types of bacteria to milk along with some other stuff to make different types of cheeses. And there are so many. Maybe you're a fan of mozzarella. That's the kind that you usually find on pizza. And I know we're big fans of pizza. Or maybe you like cheddar cheese. Cheddar makes an excellent grilled cheese sandwich. And there are so many more. Anyway, back to Swiss. I know you've been wanting to find out the whole story about those holes. <laughs> I know, that was a cheesy joke. The bacteria that cheesemakers add to Swiss cheese eat some of the cheese, but that's not exactly what causes the holes. When the bacteria eat the milk, they cause a reaction. A reaction is when two things mix together, and sometimes they create a third thing. In this case, when the bacteria eat the milk, they create bubbles. Those bubbles take up space in the cheese, and when they eventually pop, we're left with holes. Totally weird, right? But here's the thing. The Swiss cheese we eat today doesn't have as many holes in it as it used to, and sometimes it ends up not having any holes at all. So what's different about the way we make Swiss cheese now? We're still using the same bacteria. Scientists think there are less holes these days because the bacteria aren't doing all the work in making them. Little bits of hay might be helping the process along. So what's hay, and why is it in cheese? Hay is something you'll find on a lot of farms. It's dried out grass that's used to feed animals, like cows and sheep and other animals that make milk. So little tiny bits of hay might accidentally get into the buckets used for collecting milk. Then scientists think the bubbles from the bacteria form around these little bits of hay. So the hay is important for creating the bubbles that make the holes when they pop. Now that cheesemakers have more modern ways of making cheese, hay doesn't get into the buckets anymore. So that might be why there aren't so many holes anymore, even though the bacteria is the same. And there you have it, the mystery is solved. Hay and bacteria work together as a team to make bubbles that leave holes when they pop. So the holes definitely aren't made by mice or rats or robot rats eating the cheese. Squeaks just gave me the nicest Valentine's Day surprise ever, a bouquet of flowers. Flowers are fun to look at and they usually smell great, but they actually have a really important job. They use their pretty colors and smells to attract animals which help make new plants. If you've seen our episode about fruit, you might remember that some animals like bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, and even bats move powdery stuff called pollen from one flower to another. These animals are called pollinators, and the pollen they carry helps flowers make the seeds that can grow into new plants. So that's a flower's job, to use its nice colors and smells to attract pollinators. Each part of the plant, from the long green stem to the beautiful petals, helps the flower do that job. And you can see how each part of the plant works if you look at it up close. Botanists, the scientists who study plants, will sometimes learn more about a plant by cutting it open and looking at the pieces. Squeaks, would it be okay if we took a closer look at one of these flowers? Great, you can try this at home too. 
All you need is a flower, a knife, and help from a grown-up since you'll need to cut some things. The flower we're going to use is called a lily, but most other kinds of flowers will work too. The first thing you should do is separate all the main parts of the flower. Cut the flower off of the stem, then take off the leaves. Now that all of the big parts are separated, you can take a closer look at each of them. The stem is really strong and stiff. That's because it needs to support the rest of the plant. The stem also connects to the roots of the plant. The roots suck up water and nutrients from the ground, and the stem brings it to the leaves of the flowers. This flower's roots were already trimmed off, which is why you can't see them. Another one of the stem's jobs is to bring food from the leaves to the flower. So let's look at the leaves next. Leaves grow out of the stem, and they're full of green stuff called chlorophyll. When the sun shines on the leaves, the chlorophyll turns sunlight into food for the plants. See those little lines running through the leaf? Those are veins, and they're a lot not like the veins that move blood through your body. The veins in the leaf bring water and nutrients in from the stem, and they carry the food the chlorophyll made to the rest of the plant. So the stem and the leaves collect and carry water, food, and other nutrients that help the flowers grow and stay healthy. So now let's look at the flower. Flowers make a sugary liquid called nectar that pollinators love to eat. So to a pollinator, the flower's color and smell are like a big sign that says, there's lots of food here, come eat. If you pull the petals off the flower, you can see that there are these sort of long, dangly things left inside. They're called the stamen, and they make the pollen. When a pollinator finds a flower, it comes to eat nectar, and while it's eating, pollen from the stamen gets stuck to the animal. Then, when it flies off to get nectar from another flower, it spreads the pollen to that other flower, and that's pollination. Now, there's just one part left this sort of big stick thing called the pistil. That's the part of the flower that collects the pollen that pollinators bring from other flowers. It's kind of sticky on the end, so the pollen sticks to it. If pollen from another flower makes its way into the pistil, the pistil can use the pollen to make seeds. And then those seeds can eventually become new plants. So the next time you're outside, take a look at all the flowers around you. There are thousands of different kinds, but they all do basically the same job. Job. Thanks for joining us today, and thank you, Squeaks, for bringing me such a nice surprise. I got you a little something, too. Oh, I'm glad you like it! It's a beautiful clear night outside, and clear nights are a great time to look up at the stars. And right now, we're looking at a bright spot in the sky that looks like a star, but it's not a star at all. It's a planet. The planet Saturn. Wow, I can tell it's Saturn because of those rings around its middle. Our telescope isn't strong enough to let us see Saturn very closely, but scientists who study space, called astronomers, have tools that they can use to take some really awesome pictures of this planet. Like this one. Nice, right? And big. Saturn is much bigger than Earth. How much bigger? Well, if Saturn were hollow in the middle, like an enormous ball, you'd be able to fit more than 700 Earths inside it. Saturn is one of the eight planets in our solar system. Counting outward from the sun, it's number six. It's one of the gas giants, a huge planet made mostly of gas. And like all of the planets, Saturn moves around the sun in a path that's kind of like an oval. This path is called an orbit. But not all orbits go around the sun. Things can orbit planets too, including Earth, like our very own moon. The one you might say good night to, it travels in an orbit around the Earth. But check this out, Saturn has 62 moons. Each one takes its own path, its own orbit around the planet. And you know what else moves in an orbit around Saturn? those awesome rings. Let's look at Saturn's rings a little more closely. Scientists think that there are seven major rings. Each one is named after a letter of the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. The rings may look solid, kind of like a hula hoop, but each one is actually made of lots of different pieces of rock and ice. Some of these pieces are as small as a speck of dust, and some are as big as houses, and even small mountains. And when we see a picture of Saturn, the rings look like they're standing still, but they're not. They're definitely on the move. Each of the pieces that makes up the rings moves around Saturn 
in an orbit. So how did the rings get there? Well, no one is totally sure, but astronomers have some good ideas. One idea is that the rings might have to do with Saturn's moons. Since Saturn is so big and has so many moons, some scientists think that maybe a long time ago it had even more. And it's possible that some of these moons broke apart, maybe because they were hit by other objects flying by, like asteroids or comets. And then after those big collisions, all of that dust and rock and ice that was left behind stayed in orbit around Saturn and became its famous rings. But Saturn's rings are always changing. Since the chunks of rock and ice are moving as they orbit Saturn, they sometimes smash into each other and break apart. That means there's still lots to see and lots to learn about them. Greetings, bird brains. It's me, Dino. Jesse asked me to visit the fort today to talk about my favorite subject in the whole wide world, dinosaurs. You've probably heard before that dinosaurs, the giant reptiles that walked the earth millions of years ago, are extinct. That means they're not around anymore. And it's true that most of the dinosaurs did go extinct, but not all of them. 65 million years ago, big changes were happening all around the world. Lots of volcanoes were erupting, and then a giant asteroid collided with Earth in a huge explosion. For a long time after that, the world was very dark, and then very cold, and then very hot. With no sunlight, a lot of the plants died. So the dinosaurs that ate plants didn't have enough to eat. So many of them died too. And that meant that dinosaurs that ate other dinosaurs didn't have enough food either, and a lot of them went extinct. So it was a really hard time to be a dinosaur, but some dinosaurs were clever enough and talented enough to tough it out because their bodies had just the right adaptations, certain traits that helped them survive these big changes. The dinosaurs that survived had little dinosaur babies, and soon their babies had their own little babies all the way down the family tree. And the animals that came from them are still living here on Earth. We call them da 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 da. Birds! That means that birds like me, Dino, are descendants of dinosaurs. And dinosaurs are my ancestors. Like my great, 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 great grandparents. So I'm part of the dinosaur family tree. And since birds are part of the dinosaur family, I'm not just a descendant of a dinosaur, I am one. So the dinosaurs live. Now, how do we know that birds are related to dinosaurs? Well, we have lots of clues, specifically from theropods, a group of two-legged dinosaurs that also included velociraptors and Tyrannosaurus rex. Hundreds of millions of years ago, way before the earliest birds appeared, dinosaurs were developing lots of bird-like adaptations. Theropod dinosaurs especially started to have a lot of bird-like traits that would later help birds take to the skies. Like feathers, lots of dinosaurs even dinosaurs that didn't become birds had feathers. Some of these feathers were more like little hairs, which probably helped dinosaurs keep warm. But some types of theropods wound up with bigger, fancier feathers and even wings. Before they were birds, fancy feathers might have been used to keep these dinosaurs and their eggs safe and warm or to communicate with other dinosaurs. But even though bigger theropods, like some kinds of tyrannosaurs, had feathers, they couldn't just flap their arms and fly around. To really be able to get off the ground, you need wide, powerful wings and a small body. While lots of types of dinosaurs were becoming gigantic, some theropods, including those that eventually gave rise to birds, were getting smaller. So lots of dinosaurs already looked and moved a lot like birds. And some of the theropod dinosaurs were becoming more like birds all the time, getting smaller, growing wings, and developing beaks instead of teeth. Over millions of years, all of the pieces of the bird puzzle were coming together one by one. By about 150 million years ago, the earliest dino birds were in the air. Some of them could fly, but looked very different from the birds we know today. And some didn't fly, but they had a lot in common with today's birds. Now, millions of years later, when that asteroid hit Earth and the volcanoes started to erupt and everything started changing, some dinosaurs had a hard time surviving. And a lot of the big ones, like T-Rex, were so big, they had trouble finding enough food to eat. But the most bird-like groups of theropods were very small. Only about one kilogram were as heavy as a pineapple. That meant it was easier for them to survive on less food and to find places to live. And because they were so small, these early birds were also able to use their wings to take flight. Not only did some of these flying dinosaurs survive, they really took off. We have more than 10,000 types of birds around today. So the next time you see one of us feathered friends flying around, you'll be able to point to it and say, hey look, a dinosaur.